He's nothing without his toy. Don't underestimate them. You're right. Mr. Jameson, I have something that might interest you. Wake up, dog. Coming to us in the 302nd issue of Iron Man, after Stark Industries was falsely implicated in a scandal, society was under the impression that its CEO, Tony Stark, was exploiting the poor for his own end. This was at a time that the symbiote Venom was beginning to see himself as a guardian of the innocent. So in retaliation, he tracked down Tony Stark and bit his head clean off. Now thankfully, this Tony Stark was actually a life model decoy that Tony was controlling remotely. Venom knew pretty quick where the real Tony was and running for his life, Tony headed to his armory knowing he could have possibly survived a direct encounter with the alien without his Iron Man suit. Tony managed to get to the armory and don his costume. Iron Man reasoned with him, telling him that Stark was innocent and that he will prove it in time. Venom agreed to back off, but he threatened to be back. Next up, we're talking about Molecule Man. Back in the OG Secret Wars story, the Beyonder had gathered a rather large handful of heroes and another rather large handful of villains. Cobbled together a whole world and then put them all on it and said, defeat your enemies and I'll grant you a wish. In an attempt to rescue some of their captured fellow villains, Doctor Doom leads a blitz against the Avengers base of operations and the heroes are caught completely unawares. While they rescued their villainous comrades, Molecule Man basically used his powers to blow up the base of the Avengers. But extraordinarily, the heroes somehow survived that. This is when the newly created Titania chucks a giant object in their direction. But it's the Molecule Man who really takes the cake here. He uses his powers to raise up an entire mountain range, which he then hovers above the recovering heroes and drops it. In a testament to the strength of the Incredible Hulk, he was able to catch this mountain range and keep the rest of the heroes safe just long enough for them to find a way out. There have been numerous times where the King Pin has thrown Spider-Man into the dirt. In The Amazing Spider-Man number 50 to 52 is the famous arc where Spider-Man gives up being a hero and in his absence the Kingpin jumps on the opportunity. Kingpin is much faster and much much stronger than Spider-Man initially realizes, being actually composed of almost entirely muscle. He gets Peter with a good grab and a slam and then out of left field he uses a gas to knock out the spider by the end of issue 51. Issue 52 sees Kingpin's goons putting Spider-Man and J. Jonah Jameson in an extremely supervillainy chamber. Sure enough, Spider-Man escapes, but even the final fight against Kingpin sees the villain get a bunch of good hits in, and he even escapes. DC Comics Futures End depicts a world in which Brother I transformed most of the superheroes into basically cyborg bugs. Bruce Wayne creates a time machine to prevent Brother I's rule from ever occurring. Now, Although Bruce was unable to travel back in time, the new Batman, Terry McGinnis, took his place. Unfortunately, Terry only traveled 30 years into the past, arriving five years too late. Terry teamed up with Tim Drake, who came out of retirement, to stop Brother Eye's technological apocalypse from ever happening. Unfortunately, Terry accidentally sped up the process though, and ultimately sacrificed himself in the battle with Brother Eye. Tim then took Terry's bat suit, traveling back in time five years, preventing the arrival of heroes from Earth 2. When Tim went back 35 years into the future, he was shocked to learn that nothing had basically changed at all. Humanity was still controlled by Brother Eye's technology. But next up, in the sixth issue Thanos wins storyline, Thanos wins, ending like 90% of life in the universe. And it basically shows a future version of the Earth 616 reality where Thanos slays every everything and rules at the end of time. Perhaps the worst fate fell onto the shoulders of the Incredible Hulk. In this incredibly dark future, Thanos keeps the Incredible Hulk in his dungeon. The Hulk is old, bearded, and basically 
begging to be laid to rest. It's also revealed that Steve Rogers was fed to the Hulk while he was still alive. The Hulk gets used momentarily to fight the incredibly powerful Silver Surfer before he reverts to Banner, begging for the Surfer to end his life, which happens a few panels later, but it's Thanos who delivers the blow. The 2000 Superman storyline, Superman Emperor Joker, follows the Joker after he obtains the ability to alter reality by tricking Mr. Mixelpidilic into granting him 99.99% of his reality warping abilities. He has Batman in an endless cycle of death and revival. Every day, Joker finds a new and inventive way to slay the Dark Knight, and every day, he brings him back to life to do it all again. At one point, Superman finds the remains of the Dark Knight and throws together a makeshift grave for his close friend, only for Batman to eventually burst through the freshly packed soil and reveal what the Joker has been doing to him, saying, quote, I've reached the point where I've come to doubt my own existence. There are plenty of times where the Joker has one-upped superpower do-gooders. Aquaman actually struggled with the Joker while underwater, so that seems perfect. In Legends of the DC Universe number 26 and 27, Joker heads to Atlantis to get away from Batman. Now even though Aquaman knows what the Joker is up to, the Joker is still able to convince the people of Atlantis that he is the king of the surface world and that he can help them find a cure for their infected fish. So this isn't really a physical defeat, but more so a psychological one. But okay, one last Joker point. In a Titans East special, the Joker teams up with Bizarro to help him kidnap some random famous singer. When the Teen Titans show up to save her, the Joker sends Bizarro after Starfire, Cyborg, and Wonder Girl while he stays and holds the hostage, leaving only Kid Flash, Robin, Beast Boy, and Raven to fight the Joker alone. While Kid Flash is able to unarm the Joker, it turns out that it's actually an explosive which Wally tries to run to a safe location, but it goes off, incapacitating him. Then it's Raven turn. Being as awesome as she is, she makes the Joker's worst nightmares appear before him in his own mind. Turns out that the Joker actually finds his nightmares to be absolutely hilarious. Once the Titans are able to use blue kryptonite to cripple Bizarro, the entire team is able to focus on the Joker and he does go down, but for a moment there, the Joker showed he could have possibly taken down at least half of the Teen Titans by himself. Marvel's Blood Hunt event has been really cool so far and the superpowered team of villains known as the Blood Coven are certainly very scary. In issue number one of the event, when the sun is blocked out and the vampires begin attacking, the Avengers assemble on Impossible City, called there by Blade. Once they all arrive and Blade's truck is teleported in, the Avengers are suddenly met with the arrival of the five Blood Coven members, and they absolutely get wrecked. Unusual, one of the vampires is able to feast on the Scarlet Witch's chaos magic, while Cruel is able to infiltrate Iron Man's new armor with these barbed wire-like tendrils that do some pretty serious damage to Tony himself. The damage scene is able to take down both Vision and Thor using their abilities that allow the vampire to cut through anything. Smoke Eater gets powered off of some collected souls and becomes strong enough to swing Captain Marvel around like a ragdoll. It's kind of hilarious. And then at the end of the fight while the Avengers escape, T'Challa tries to hold them off until Bloodstorm punches straight through his chest. The Avengers got beat down really bad in this comic. And lastly, the symbiote god known as Null made one heck of an entrance when the King in Black event kicked off. Not only did Null unleash legions of dragons to make landfall and cover the world with his bonding symbiote matter in this issue, but he also reveals that he has several godlike celestials under his command as well. Now the losses begin with the Sentry, literally one of the most powerful heroes on the earth. The King in Black ripped the Sentry in two as if he were made of paper. Null also took control of all the symbiote matter that he had covered the globe with, quickly overtaking many of the heroes with his power before covering the whole world in a massive symbiote dome. On that one page, he took down Captain America, Daredevil, Luke Cage, Captain Marvel, Miss Marvel, Iron Fist, The Thing, Wolverine, and Jean Grey, not to mention most of the other heroes who were fighting in New York at the time, except for Spider-Man and Iron Man. His symbiotes also consumed Storm in the following 
pages, and the final hero to be beaten was Venom himself, who Null just ripped from Eddie Brock before throwing Eddie off of a building. Like I said, this was one heck of an opening move. Magneto, the true definition of who are you, friend or foe? Magneto has humbled the X Men many times, but Magneto Triumphant will be our first example today. I also like this one because it has to do with the time Magneto was turned into a baby. This story was released in the 1970s, and the X Men were fighting another bad guy, actually, Mesmero. He had the team mesmerized, so incapacitated. By the time they break out of that, Magneto is on the scene and has already defeated Mesmero. He did it to capture the X Men himself and lock them in chairs and then turn them into babies. Magneto is one of the most powerful mutants out there, so that's common knowledge, but still having the X Men team up coming for you, it's a lot to deal with. The reason he managed to win, the X Men decided to fight him one on one. That's the worst idea I've ever heard. There was a lesson in here. The one on one thing obviously didn't work. Once trapped, Magneto leaves the team to a robot and he goes out and causes chaos. Rookie mistake, finish your battles yourself because Storm frees the team and they showed they learned from their mistakes fighting Magneto as a team and defeating the powerful mutant. Zorn technically sublimes infiltration of the X-Men school and then resulting destruction has to be a sore spot for the super family. Zorn was originally introduced to be Magneto in a disguise, he wasn't real. The story ended with Magneto dying. But Zorn was such a loved character and Marvel needed Magneto alive again so they decided to retcon this. Zorn was real and had a twin and Zorn was just pretending to be Magneto pretending to be Zorn. He did all that chaotic stuff because he was under Sublime's mind control, the intention was to make mutants appear dangerous and unstable so when it came time to convince humans to side against mutants, it would just be easier. Zorn was a trusted friend to the X-Men, he was a teacher at the school and worked very closely with young, traumatized teens. That's not a position you give to just anyone. In all fairness, when Zorn started teaching, he was Zorn. He was possessed while at the school. Still, it must have been a little paper cut sting when the X-Men found out their school was infiltrated. Throwing a bucket of of lemon juice on that paper cut, Zornino went wild, destroying the city and ending Jean Grey. Wolverine took care of him, but the damage was already done. Mojo once roasted Wolverine in front of trillions. X-Men the Animated Series is the gift that keeps on giving. In episode 11 of season 2, the X-Men are up against Mojo. Mojo is from a world addicted to TV. Whoever creates the most interesting TV rules the world. Who would be better for a reality show than the X-Men? They even have a dramatic love triangle, and Wolverine, Cyclops, and Jean are exactly what led to this humbling. The X-Men are placed in parodies of popular TV shows like Miami Vice and Star Trek, Becoming Miami Mutants and Rogue Star. The third show is a parody of the 60s sitcom I Dream of Jeannie. This one has changed to I Dream of Jean, poking fun at the famous love triangle. Fans recall this episode as being fun and over the top. The title card for the fake series looks scandalous, but Jean is wearing a peach colored suit, so it looks bad, but it isn't. As for someone that was actually roasted for not wearing many clothes, Horticulture beat up the X-Men with their wit and their fists. Horticulture is a group of women that believe the earth was at its purest when it wasn't so populated. Their goal then is to depopulate the earth. They use their biology and other scientific skills to modify anything botanical. The old women go to Krakoa because of its exotic plant life. In their words, they love the S word out of flowers. Horticulture starts spraying mutants with this green stuff that just stops movement. Cyclops, Emma Frost, and Sebastian Shaw, they find them to take care of business, only they get way more than they bargained for. The old women came to play and they came to slay. Before a punch is even thrown, they roast Frost's clothing, or lack thereof, establish they have taken care of their cheating husbands, and just generally prove they are going to be harder to take down than anticipated. One of the old ladies gets thrown to the ground and Cyclops is very concerned for her well-being, only she faked hurting her hip, it was a lie, and she gets Cyclops with the green stuff, screaming, stupid boy, we do water aerobics and yoga four days a week at the YMCA. The X-Men got the equivalent of getting beat up with a handbag. Grotesque literally took out one of the most important figures to the X-Men, Professor X. If that doesn't count as humbling, I don't know what does. So Grotesque basically lives kind of like under the service world, and his world was totally destroyed. He guessed that the cause came from up here, and he guessed correctly. Correctly, it was a machine that caused it here on the surface world and it affected the underworld. He came to the surface to avenge his people. During the final big battle between
between Grotesque and the X-Men. The machine, it blows up and it happens to take out Professor X, but psych, it turns out that was never Professor X. For in the past little while, Professor X was actually Changeling. The real Professor was off preparing for a battle he didn't want the X-Men to know about yet. Changeling was a shapeshifter that was going to pass soon and wanted to end his life on a good guy note. Still, the X-Men didn't know all of that at the time. Even if some of them did, they still had to watch the physical body of the Professor roll over. Grotesque went on to cause a variety of problems throughout his life. He is a hard villain to get rid of. Magneto again, this time for ripping the adamantium off Wolverine's skeleton because what the heck was that? Marvel, leave Wolverine alone challenge, level impossible. This famous Magneto the Ripper moment happened in X-Men 25, it was the 90s. Wolverine has almost never been hurt so bad before. His healing factor didn't know what to do. Jean had to hold his body together here telepathically just to keep Wolverine clinging onto his life. This is probably the closest time Wolverine has ever come to actually laying to rest, but he is Wolverine so Marvel can't do that. It took a very long time for Logan to heal and after he went a little bit feral. We learned about the bone claws though. He lost his nose, he wore a bandana, can't judge him for any of that. Getting humbled that bad makes you do funny things. Do we love Jean Grey? Of course, that's mother right there. Do we love Dark Phoenix? Maybe in a different way. Interesting character, but please stop being so mean. The Dark Phoenix first appearing caused literally so many problems for the X-Men. It was like they had a punch card for defeats, like lose nine times, you get the 10th as a win. This was a real moment for Jean Grey fans. She she was active, active at this time. She was devouring stars and destroying entire civilizations and taking the X-Men out of course. Now the thing is, was it Grey doing all these horrible things? Not really. The Dark Phoenix is its own thing. Grey is just one of the only people that can act as a appropriate host for it. So the Dark Phoenix is the one responsible for all the bad things that have happened, but wore Jean like a cover, roping her into all this damage even though she didn't want to do it. Jean Grey further proves she didn't want to do it when she sacrifices herself to save the day. Scarlet Witch is not always a villain, but she has done some truly evil things to make her a slightly gray area. Scarlet Witch destroyed the X-Men when she caused M-Day. She didn't just humble the team. She all but eliminated the entire gene pool. Her famous line, no more mutants, caused one of the most devastating losses the mutant community has ever seen. They not only lost the fight, they also lost their powers and many mutants lost their lives. There were only a few survivors from M day, it took a long time to figure out how to regain lives and powers. Even when they figured it all out, the solution wasn't perfect and many mutants did not return. If it makes you feel any better, there were repercussions for Wanda. She lost almost everyone's trust and is now mildly feared, only mildly because she did help bring everybody back that she could, which was the least she could do in my opinion. M.M. Mutant Master wasn't the X-Men's day, week, month, or even their year. You can probably guess the vibes were going to be bad. Not only did many people pass, dozens more were left seriously injured. One mutant even lost one of the most important pieces of his body. Angel lost his wings. He'd had them so long that learning to live without them was tough. Him losing his wings during this tragic event also led to him becoming a horseman for Apocalypse, Angel of Death. In literature, which Marvel is, the loss of angel wings usually means the character is experiencing a fall from grace can't think of a bigger fall than becoming a horseman for Apocalypse. If that hadn't happened though, Angel wouldn't have had new cool powers, so it's kind of like we feel bad, but we're kind of glad he at least got something out of it all. X-Men Days of Future Past was a nightmare. Everybody had something bad happen to them. It's set in a future dystopian world. Mutants are placed in evil camp situations as there is a lot of mutant fear in the general public. The Sentinels run everything, and they are mutant hunting robots. This comic arc was released in the 80s, so the future dystopian world was actually 2013. The few X-Men that are not captured are at plan Z when it comes to fixing this problem. So their last effort is to send Kitty Pride's mind back in time, intending for it to possess herself in the past so she can warn the X-Men about the future so they can prevent the damage from happening. Well, the reason things took a turn for the worst for the X-Men was an important politician getting taken out by the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, so they have to stop that. They also have to prevent the deaths of Professor X and Moira. McTaggart. They do of course, but even though they win, it's not actually clear if the future 
from 2013 was totally stopped or just delayed. It's almost a decade after it was supposed to happen, so hopefully they're good. Now, of course, Thanos in the comics is still a big deal, but in the MCU, I feel like they beefed him up even more. So much so that a lot of people compare Thanos to Darkseid. Thanos is kind of like Marvel's Darkseid equivalent. Even in the comics, sure, but the MCU reality lifted him up to be on the same level as DC's Darkseid and make him once again worthy of that comparison. Thanos is also obviously super overpowered in the Marvel Cinematic Universe because he is armed with the Infinity Gauntlet and wielding all of the Infinity Stones. If you can survive doing so, this would make almost any character unstoppable. But honestly, even in the comics when Thanos has not been armed with the gauntlet, he has managed to decimate entire planets and threaten the existence of life on Earth and throughout the universe time and time again. It's the Mad Titan's strong will and his determination as well as his physical might and prowess that honestly just makes him so deadly. And he's also he's just very committed. He's a committed guy. Which villain do you think is the most committed? Let me know in the comments. Khonshu is an interesting one because most people wouldn't think of Khonshu as a villain. Khonshu is the god of the moon who also happens to be the person that gives, the person, who also happens to be the being that gives Mark Spector, aka Moon Knight, his power set. At least, uh, depending on which story we're reading, but for the most part, that's how it goes. So with Khonshu being attached to a hero, you wouldn't really think that he'd be going up against Avengers, and yet that is exactly what happened in the age of Khonshu here. Khonshu manipulated Mark into doing his bidding, getting him to take from the Avengers elements of their power so that they could use those to fight against a greater threat, which was Mephisto. The problem with this being that while Khonshu did want to do this so that he could defeat Mephisto, who is obviously a really bad guy at the end of the day, Khonshu also wanted to take over Earth, kind of, and turn it into uh, like an Egyptian afterlife, if you would. In the end, even Moon Knight turned on Khonshu once this was revealed and ended up joining up with the Avengers instead. The group of them were then able to beat Khonshu back together and he actually ended up pretty much imprisoned. But this doesn't change the fact that through a Moon Knight, Khonshu was actually able to humble pretty much everybody on this team here. It's kind of unfortunate what happened to the Chaos King. He actually seemed like a pretty neat villain in theory. The event that he is primarily known for is Chaos War. Unfortunately, Chaos War took place right before the Epic Fear Itself event in terms of Marvel chronological print history and uh, pretty much just became like overshadowed by that. Ultimately, it also felt less planned out. The Chaos King, also known as Amatsu Mikaboshi, is a cosmic entity and basically a Japanese god who met his end during the events of Chaos War where he was defeated. So we got, we got an Egyptian god and we got a Japanese god. During Chaos War, the Chaos King used his powers to reverse life and death, meaning the dead heroes came back to life while those who had been alive were now deceased instead. As a Japanese kami, he has godlike powers, making him insanely durable and strong, while also having supernatural abilities as well. The Chaos King's powers were more dark in origin, though, when it came to their magic type. Rakil managed to pull one over on the Avengers and honestly, most of the cosmos and all of Earth after years later revealing that she actually had not died, but had been alive the whole time, undercover and secretly scheming to unite the Kree and Skrull empires under the rule of her grandson. It had also been so long that her return was mostly met with confusion from a lot of fans at that point because many who were reading her reappearance actually didn't recognize her at first. Even I had to do some digging to fully understand the importance of who she was. I finished that issue and was like, huh? Who is this? And then I was like, oh. Rakil, cool. Rakil was once one of the rulers of the Skrull Empire. Unlike Varanki, who was made queen after the Skrull's homeworld fell, Rakil was actually the Skrull Empress back when the homeworld was still around and doing well. Rakil first appeared back in 1979 and would perish in the comics in issue 257 of Fantastic Four in 1983, only a few short years later. She returned a few years ago in the Empire event where she was revealed to be Hulkling's grandmother, who survived the destruction of Tarnax IV and who had actually been working, like I said, behind the scenes undercover as a Kree pursuer while putting into motion her plan to unite the Skrull and Kree empires together, which did work and we got the Alliance. Ultron is an interesting character. The amount of times they have almost succeeded in destroying all of humanity and the Avengers is honestly pretty impressive. And while Ultron may have not succeeded fully in taking the Avengers out, they have at least taken down one Avenger at the time seemingly permanently, for a while seemingly permanently, because this character was gone for a long time until recently. That would be their their creator, 
Hank Pym, aka Ant-Man. Ant-Man ended up being merged with Ultron, and although initially it was believed that he was still alive in there, but just existing within a shared consciousness, we would actually later learn that he did not actually survive this process, and it was instead at that moment that he became deceased, despite some of his physical form still seeming to survive. However, as of Avengers Inc., Hank has returned, but still, for a while there, he was pretty perma-dead. The Progenitor is really a superhero who humbled the Avengers by simply judging them. The Progenitor put the Avengers to a test in multiple ways. One of the ways they actually challenged the Avengers and all of the heroes of Earth's strength was when they came to judge humanity. The other is when they challenged the Avengers in the way of their own capability as Iron Man, aka Tony Stark, was actually one of the Avengers to work on creating the Progenitor and even after that, the Progenitor still was not made to be a hero. Literally helped make the Progenitor and then the Progenitor turned around and was like, actually I'm going to judge all of humanity now. Not a great look. And this was a celestial that was of course also based off of Tony Stark's nervous system. It was partially based off of Tony and yet still not a hero. So what does that say about Iron Man? I do not know. Although I love that Iron Man still got judged with a thumbs up. Hilarious. But regardless of this, the Progenitor also tested each and every Avengers member on a one-on-one -on -one basis. When they decided that humanity might not be worth saving, the Earth might not be worth saving, and in order to decide, they would actually have to judge each person on Earth individually. Some Avengers succeeded and passed this test, and some Avengers failed their tests. But ultimately, they opened themselves up to be judged by the Progenitor by being part of the Progenitor's creation, and also uh, kind of put the entire world at stake. So, yeah. Speaking of villains who just love to pull the wool over the Avengers' eyes, which of course many on our list have tried here, up next we are talking about Mephisto. During the 2021 Heroes Reborn event, Mephisto was revealed to be basically the big bad behind all of this. Heroes Reborn, or this version of Heroes Reborn anyways, was a world in which the Squadron Supreme were the premier superhero team of the world, being known there as the Squadron Supreme of America in this reality. There were no Avengers here, there was only the Squadron Supreme, and we'd later learn that Mephisto was actually the one behind creating this Squadron Supreme, and was actually in league with, get this, Phil Coulson. Yeah, in this event, Agent Phil Coulson, he's also evil. It was pretty crazy. Fortunately, in the end, the Avengers were able to figure out what was going on, fight back, and change the world back to normal, but still, it was pretty crazy that Mephisto was even able to change the world so drastically to begin with, and the Avengers were just like, I don't know what happened. I don't know. It's weird for the most part anyways. I'm not even disappointed in the Avengers for being humbled by this next villain here. We're talking about Magus. Magus is the evil alternate of Adam Warlock, kind of like his evil twin. Basically, Magus's main thing is the Church of Universal Truth, which inherently doesn't sound very evil based on the name or bad, but it is actually very evil and very bad. Just trust me. At one point, he threatens all of Earth's heroes when he attacks Earth with doppelgangers of each hero. Just as he is a dark reflection of Adam Warlock, each hero on Earth then has to face a dark reflection of themselves, and it's during this attack that he actually threatens to basically completely overthrow or, you know, conquer Earth and all. All of its heroes. Immortus is an interesting villain. Technically, Immortus is also Kang the Conqueror, but Immortus is also an alternate version of Kang from sort of like a different timeline. Time traveling villains, time traveling people, it's weird. Immortus has been a foe of the Avengers multiple times and has done a few things to humble them, especially specific members. For this point, I'm mostly going to talk about Iron Man and Captain Marvel. Immortus made it so that Iron Man would be a sleeper agent working for them, activating them, and turning them on their own team. The Avengers. In the end, Tony did rise above Immortus's influence and ultimately sacrificed himself to save his team, going back to the side of good in his final moments, but it was a pretty devastating blow having their own team member turn on them and threaten to defeat, well, pretty much all of them at the behest of their nemesis, Immortus. AKA Kinda Kang. When it comes to Carol Danvers' interaction with Immortus, I'm actually more talking about Immortus' son here, Marcus Immortus. Still, it was through learning from his father that Marcus was able to take and also um, forcefully seduce Carol, and later managed to convince her to basically run away with him and leave the Avengers, which was a whole weird thing that happened. It wasn't good, but it also goes to show you just how influential Immortus can be and how dangerous he can be through that influence. And here, I tried to save the best and honestly, kind of the most spoiler 
Distillery, most recent one for last. That is if you've been reading current comics because this one is coming at us from Blood Hunt. For those who haven't been following along with Blood Hunt, it's the newest event over at Marvel Comics, at least at the time of this recording. It is an event that we are going to see throughout the summer. The whole of the Marvel Universe is going to have to band together as they deal with a massive global vampire invasion. And in issue number one of Blood Hunt, the Avengers are already not looking so good when they come up against a group when they come up against a group known as the Blood Coven. The Blood Coven are a group of vampires that have fed on supernatural blood and basically each have supernatural traits. They use their powers, their special abilities to take on the Avengers and in their first encounter pretty much handily defeat almost all of them. Yikes. Not only do they defeat the Avengers team, but they also defeat one of their sort of members as well, who is also like their headquarters, and that's their base that is known as the city, which is a member of the team as well because the city also has sentience. You know what's bad when the Avengers are down and so is their base? <laughs> At number 10 is Toy Man. Toy Man, an unexpected powerhouse to the DC Universe, stands as a testament to the idea that power isn't solely defined by raw strength. His arsenal of whimsical toys may seem harmless, but they've confounded to some of the mightiest heroes, with some iconic showdowns proving his prowess. In the Justice League animated series, Toy Man took on the Man of Steel himself, armed with a giant robot wielding a disintegrating beam. He used it and targeted Batman and Wonder Woman, but it was Superman, the embodiment of strength, who interfered. With unwavering heroism, he sacrificed himself, intercepting the beam that vanquished him instantly, leaving no trace behind. This momentous clash underscores that power that isn't always about brute force. Toy Man's genius and unpredictability outwitted Superman, reminding us that even the most potent heroes can fall before unconventional adversaries. At number 9, Wolverine loses to a couple of dudes. Wolverine, the indomitable mutant known for his regenerative powers, faced a stunning defeat at the hands of mere agents. This pivotal loss occurred during his dark past as part of the Weapon X program, aka like his origin story. These agents didn't possess any superhuman strength or extraordinary abilities, but they just wielded advanced technology, including a stun gun. In a dramatic encounter, the agents ambushed Wolverine, shooting him with a stun gun. Though Logan, with his exceptional healing factor, attempted to resist, the electric shock disrupted his powers temporarily, and consequently, he was incapacitated and whisked away into the nefarious laboratory for the notorious adamantium bonding process. This episode episode serves as a stark reminder that even the most powerful superheroes can fall victim to cunning tactics and advanced weaponry, emphasizing the vulnerability that often accompanies extraordinary abilities in the world of comics. If you're enjoying this video so far, by the way, you can support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. At number 8, the Joker. The Joker's ability to topple superheroes while struggling against Batman is indeed perplexing. It raises questions about the power dynamics within the DC universe. Batman's unbreakable will and intellect have often been weapons against the Crown Prince of Crime, but it seems like the Joker has an eerie knack for unsettling even the Man of Steel. In the Emperor Joker storyline, the Joker's cunning manipulation of reality through Mr. Pitylix's powers leads to Superman's imprisonment in Arkham Asylum, a shocking outcome. And furthermore, the Injustice Saga reveals another sinister chapter where Joker's deception pushes Superman to the brink, resulting in Lois Lane's death and Metropolis's annihilation at Superman's hands. Perhaps it's the unpredictability of chaos embodied by the Joker that makes him a formidable adversary even for the mighty Superman. The complexities of hero-villain dynamics in the DC Universe continue to baffle and intrigue fans. At number 7 is Lex Luthor. In the sprawling tapestry of superhero rivalries, none have endured quite like the clash between Superman and his arch nemesis, Lex Luthor. Their epic confrontations have etched themselves into the annals of comic book lore, yet what makes this rivalry truly fascinating are the moments when the mighty Man of Steel faltered against his seemingly lesser opponent. He doesn't have any power, man. One such instance borders on the absurd. Lex Luthor's conquest over cancer. In an astonishing turn of events, Luthor uncovered a cure for this devastating disease. Crafty as ever, he ensnared Superman with a devious trap fueled by kryptonite. In a single fateful exchange, Lex emerged victorious. A bittersweet triumph for sure, but this one showcases the complexity of this age-old rivalry. Sorry Clark, but even a hero as iconic as you can't compete with curing cancer. At number 6, the Ultimates beat Thor. In the vast and intricate tapestry of superhero lore, there exists moments where the seemingly invincible stumble before adversaries who appear on the surface 
vastly inferior. The second ultimate storyline plunges us into such conundrum, where the Earth's mightiest heroes, the Avengers, find themselves ensnared in a treacherous web of deception spun by the mischievous Loki. Thor, the god of thunder wielding Mjolnir with unwavering might, stands as an emblem of power, and yet in this narrative, he's compelled to engage in a heart-wrenching battle against his comrades, manipulated by Loki's cunning illusions. Thor's innate reluctance to harm his friends proves as his Achilles' heel, and when he finally unleashes his divine fury, it's Loki who engineers a twist in reality, rendering Thor powerless. This vulnerability is exploited by the Ultimates, who, with Loki's machinations, capture the godly Avenger. At number five is Harley Quinn. Here's a classic tale of the underdog triumphing over the mighty, a narrative that twists but keeps us all on the edge of our seats. Enter Harley Quinn, the clown princess of prime, a character more known for her maniac laughter and colorful antics than her superhuman abilities. In a spiraling turn of events, Harley manages to defeat none other than the Man of Steel himself, Superman. This unlikely showdown occurred in a series of comic books where extraterrestrial forces coerce Superman into a boxing match against Harley Quinn. They journey to the Fortress of Solitude where Superman's powers were temporarily drained. In a moment of sheer audacity, Harley swung a punch that sent Superman reeling, rendering him unconscious. It's a testament to the unpredictable nature of comic book storytelling where even the mightiest heroes can be humbled by their seemingly inferior adversaries. So as they say in Gotham, how do you like that, Puddin? At number four is Killer Frost. A villain more known for her chilling presence than her formidable powers managed to pull off an incredible upset when she faced against the Man of Steel himself, Superman. In a grand showdown of Justice League versus the Squad, it seemed like another routine battle for the Justice League. They were dominating until the Enchantress entered the fray, incapacitating Superman with her mystic powers. But here's where it gets interesting. Amanda Waller, the mastermind behind the Squad, gave the order and Frost absorbed Superman's life force. In that fleeting moment, she transcended her status as a weak villain. And suddenly, she possessed strength to dispose not just Superman, but the entire Justice League. At number three is Dr. Light. In a world of superheroes and supervillains, it's not always about raw power and brute force. In case in point, Superman the Man of Steel has faced numerous foes, but some of his most astonishing defeats come at the hands of seemingly weaker villains who wielded something even more potent, intelligence. Take Dr. Light, for example. In a mind-mending twist, this villain managed to outwit the invulnerable Superman. See, rather than relying on sheer physical might, Dr. Light used cunning and manipulation. He hypnotized the Man of Steel into a state where he was willing to commit the unthinkable, unaliving himself. But it wasn't just as straightforward as it sounds. To pull off this audacious scheme, Dr. Light cleverly had Superman search for a seemingly innocuous magic wand. Little did Supes know that the seemingly harmless item would become his downfall. Dr. Light, once Superman had given it to him, had used that very wand to end him. That even in the realm of superheroes and villains, brains can often peril over brawn. At number two, Superman's lead super suit. Superman is known for his powers and intelligence, but he once fell victim to a rather embarrassing defeat. Lex Luthor, his arch nemesis, took advantage of Superman's apparent lack of facial recognition skills. He disguised himself just with a wig, and somehow the Kryptonian superhero failed to see through the ruse. Superman actually accepted a costume design sold by Luthor in disguise. The suit was encased in lead because Superman can't see through lead. But unbeknownst to the hero, that lead concealed the dreaded kryptonite his Achilles heel. Luther planned for the lead to erode away, exposing the kryptonite at just the right moment, weakening Superman when he least expected it. I mean, I don't know how Superman didn't see this coming. I mean, the suit just screamed trap with its bright yellow and purple design, complete with a green box that boldly proclaimed your name. It's a cautionary tale of overlooking the obvious, a lesson even the mightiest heroes can learn from. And at number one is Alfred Pennyworth beats up Superman. Yeah, that's right. Alfred Pennyworth, the unassuming butler of Bruce Wayne, often flies under the radar in the superhero realm, yet his unyielding determination and surprising resourcefulness has allowed him to claim a remarkable victory against one of the most iconic superheroes of all time. In the Injustice comic series, Superman, consumed by a ruthless quest for control, infiltrates the Batcave with the intent to incapacitate Superman. And with the Dark Knight left vulnerable and on the brink of defeat, Alfred steps into the ring. Now, Alfred is armed with the strength-enhancing super substance that he got from Lex Luthor, of course, and after consuming which, he wages a relentless assault on the Man of Steel. In a shocking turn of events, Alfred headbutts Superman, breaking the hero's nose, and proceeds to pummel him mercilessly, driving his face into the unforgiving floor. The surprising triumph stands as a testament to Alfred's unwavering dedication to protecting his surrogate family, showcasing that even the mightiest of superheroes can suffer humiliating defeats at the hands of seemingly weaker opponents. So the next time you're pondering the hero-villain dynamic, remember that raw strength isn't the only key to victory. Sometimes it's the unexpected, the cunning, and the strategic 
that can topple even the mightiest of caped crusaders. Number 10, Electro. Electro, even in his first appearance in issue 9 of the original Amazing Spider-Man series, was beating Spider-Man. At least, initially. When Spider-Man first meets Electro, he doesn't know what to do, and Electro gets away a few times before Spider-Man manages to stop him. At one point, Spider-Man even reaches out to try and grab Electro. Mm, not a great idea. While Electro is in his electric shock condition, his words, not mine, it turns out touching him is deadly. Spider-Man survives the great electric shock he is given, but is forced to modify his costume in order to take on Electro in the future. He adds on rubber slippers and gloves, and likely in the future would make modifications to his costume, adding in rubber insulation in case he came up against the villain again, which he would many times. Because yeah, that's only issue 9. It goes on for a lot longer than issue 9. Number 9, Mephisto. Mephisto might not win in the most obvious ways, but he definitely is always sneakily on the up and up when it comes to him versus heroes. Any heroes, really, Spider-Man included. In the case of Mephisto versus Spider-Man, that sounded more legal than I intended, but I guess we are dealing with binding contracts. Mephisto ended up helping Peter to get what he needed, but at a price. He required in exchange Peter's marriage to MJ, which for comic book continuity meant undoing that rocky but ongoing union. Spider-Man got what he wanted, Aunt May was safe and his identity was a secret once more, but I don't think he really realized what he was giving up until he experienced it. MJ didn't even seem to recall their marriage, although lately it seems to be implied that she might have known more about their past than she's let on. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you love it when I talk about villains, I love talking about villains, then be sure to show that love by giving this video a thumbs up. It really does, it really does help us out here. I'm not just saying that. They don't just pay me to say that. That's, this is the truth. Number eight, Chameleon. In his first appearance, Chameleon left Spider-Man running away in tears, ruining the day he ever became Spider-Man. Chameleon may have been apprehended in the end of issue number one of Amazing Spider-Man, but somehow it still felt as though he came out on top. Dang it, because Chameleon, you know, he's a villain, so he shouldn't win. Although I am kind of rooting for him sometimes. During their conflict, Chameleon attempted to make it seem as though Spider-Man was up to no good, impersonating him while committing acts of thievery <gasps> and fleeing from the police. Oh no! Even once Spider-Man managed to catch him, it still seemed as though Chameleon might get away. Fortunately, Spider-Man had his spider sense to let him know something was up. He managed to get away from Chameleon, but it was only because Chameleon's disguise had become damaged in the fray that the villain was caught at all. So Spider-Man didn't even really win that day. It was more just like Chameleon made a mistake. And it was like, dang it. Now it's revealed who I am because you can see the Spider-Man suit underneath and I was impersonating Spider-Man. How embarrassing. Number seven, Morlin. Not only has Morlin proven himself to be a formidable foe in various storylines, with him taking on all of the Spider-Verse twice in the Spider-Verse event and Spider-Geddon in the comics, in addition to taking out multiple Spider-Folks slash Spider-Totems along the way, but he also went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Spider-Man in the other. The worst thing slash, I guess, best thing for Morlin fans about this story is how Morlin doesn't just ever go for the, like, one-two knockout. Morlin seems to prefer drawing out his victory, teasing his victim, if you will, and enjoying Spider-Man's suffering. It's probably because Morlin's used to uh, winning so much, he's used to devouring Spider-Totem, so he's like, we'll just let this play out. At one point, Morlin devours Spider-Man's eye in a fight and beats him to within an inch of his life. However, while this definitely feels like a victorious moment for Morlin and Spider-Man was beat here, he would eventually recover, meaning that Morlin didn't get a straight victory over Spider-Man. In fact, he'd even like heal his eye back. But of course, villainous victories rarely ever get to be permanent, so I think we still need to count this one. Number six, the Lizard. While Lizard doesn't do anything crazy like succeed in completely killing Spider-Man or anything like that, he does beat him in the race against time to save his friend, Dr. Kurt Connors, who, you know, is also the Lizard. In the story shed, the lizard ends up taking over before Spider-Man can get there to try and stop it. Spider-Man arrives far too late as the lizard seems to have permanently gained dominance after devouring Kurt Connors' son against his own will. This victory would be one that would not only haunt Spider-Man, but the doctor as well. He would end up finding a way to cure himself of his lizard brain, but become stuck in his lizard form, kept in a containment cell for his crimes, but unable to bring himself to reveal Spider-Man that he 
had finally cured himself mentally of his reptilian half. This is like, this whole thing is just like a super big lizard win in my mind. Because even when Connors frees himself of the lizard, he's still stuck in the lizard form and he still is like, I'm too, I feel too guilty to be, even be able to tell people what's really going on. So the lizard like really won, even though he was gone. Number five, Mysterio. Mysterio recently got a pretty big win in the MCU, in typical Mysterio style, I must say. While he hasn't been doing too hot in the comics lately, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, in Spider-Man Far From Home, Mysterio managed to earn Spider-Man's trust and even infiltrate S.H.I.E.L.D., making them believe he was a hero from an alternate world. I'm not going to lie, even I personally wanted to believe it. It turned out this was not true, and while his backstory was a little different here, Mysterio here was still a master at illusion and a full-on villain. In the end, Quentin Beck would seemingly die during a confrontation with Spider-Man, but it turns out he had one more trick up his sleeve. And at the end of the film, we see a video recording of Beck that incriminates Spider-Man and also reveals his true identity as Peter Parker. He's gonna be in a lot of trouble in the next movie, I think. Number four, Kraven. Kraven's last hunt is a story that forever sticks out in comic book history. Especially in Spider-Man's history, it is a dark tale where Kraven finally captures his most prized prey, Spider-Man. What's more, it's also implied he kills Spidey. He then proceeds to take Spider-Man's place, proving once and for all that not only is he capable of capturing and killing the hero, but also aiming to prove that he's better than Spider-Man by beating down all his his villains brutally. In the end, we learn that Spider-Man was not actually dead, but in a comatose, death-like state all this while. He returns and Kraven acknowledges that while he seemingly won to do what Spider-Man does while keeping to his moral code is actually an impressive feat, something that Kraven likely wouldn't actually be able to do. His final hunt complete, it's then implied that Kraven takes his own life. Number three, Kingpin. There are a few times that Kingpin has beaten Spider-Man throughout the comics and alternate universes that we have explored. At one point, he actually manages to kill MJ in a what-if version of Back in Black, and while Spider-Man manages to hunt him down and even kills him, in the end, Kingpin's actions turn Spider-Man into a villain. So I'd still consider that a win for Kingpin. But what I'd really like to focus on here is the time that Kingpin managed to kill Spider-Man in Sony's groundbreaking animated film Into the Spider-Verse one of my favorite films of all time. Here, Kingpin manages to actually kill Peter Parker, the current Spider-Man of Miles Morales' universe. Although Miles would also learn of alternate universes with their own Spider-Men, Spider-Girls, and even Spider-Pigs. He would also learn of his newfound powers and himself have to protect the city as a new Spider-Man. But still, when it came to the Peter Parker of his reality, Kingpin killed him. He dead. He dead dead. So dead never coming back. Number two, Dr. Octopus. Doc Ock actually succeeds in taking Spider-Man's place, not just by impersonating him, but by actually swapping bodies with the hero. That the two swap bodies, wah, 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 with Peter ending up stuck in the dying form of Doc Ock and Doc Ock's mind now within the young and superpowered body of Spider-Man. Oh my goodness. Eventually, he would relinquish this form, giving it back to Peter when he realized he was incapable of making the tough decisions required of a more heroic spirit. But for a time, we'd come to know this version of villain and hero combined as superior Spider-Man. And if you're wondering, but wait a minute, didn't Peter, didn't Peter die in Doc Ock's body? Yes, but also his consciousness lived still on in his mind. It's a little confusing, but if you read it, it, it makes sense. It's like comic book confusing, just if you're explaining it quickly to someone in a list. Number one, Green Goblin. You can take Peter's body, you can take his mind, you can ruin his reputation, but one of the worst things you can ever do to him is to break his heart. There are many ghosts that haunt Peter Parker, but one of the most meaningful ones to this day remains that of Gwen Stacy. Gwen was Peter's childhood sweetheart. Before he and MJ were together and were a thing, he was with Gwen, who was also a science enthusiast and academic like Peter. Gwen ended up being taken hostage by the Green Goblin and thrown from a bridge. When Peter as Spider-Man went to save her with his web shooters, it's implied that his own attempt to do so was what killed her. The tension from his web caused her neck to snap. Norman Osborn has remained one of Spider-Man's most iconic villains 
to this day. And for many, the moment Green Goblin killed Gwen Stacy was where this shift really happened for his character, making him Spider-Man's greatest and most feared nemesis. Number 10, Doctor Doom. Doctor Doom and Spider-Man do not fight in the same weight class at all. However, in their first ever encounter, Spider-Man did manage to get the better of Doom, and that may have stung. So, in Amazing Spider-Man Volume 1, number 349 and 350, it did not go well for the wall crawler at all. This time, Spidey was tracking an elderly jewel thief named the Black Fox, who had stolen the priceless Trask Diamond. Black Fox had also happened to barter one of Victor Von Doom's family heirlooms, an emerald passed down to him by his late mother. Once Doom became aware of this transgression, he flew to New York and caught up with the Black Fox at the same time Spider-Man did. When Spidey intervened on the Black Fox's behalf, Doctor Doom did not hold back. Doom nonchalantly thrashed the hell out of the web slinger, leaving him with his costume in tatters and desperately scrambling away for his life. While he convinced Doom to allow him time to retrieve his old family heirloom, Peter's severe beating had left him concussed, so much so that he even hallucinated Uncle Ben. The beating he took taught Spidey an important lesson about recognizing his own limits. Number nine, Kingpin. Now, I'll admit, we at Top 10 Nerd, like a lot of comic book nerds, love to talk about the time that Peter Parker nearly ended Wilson Fisk's life, beating the heck out of him in prison in front of all of his goons. He embarrassed the heck out of Fisk that day, but that was all to prove that he can, because there have been numerous times where the Kingpin has shown Spider-Man the error of his ways. Take the very first meeting, for example. In The Amazing Spider-Man number 50 and 52, this is the famous arc where Spider-Man gives up being a superhero, and in his absence, the Kingpin jumps at the opportunity. The comic makes it pretty clear that Spider-Man assumes that Kingpin is just some big, squishy, overweight man. This proves to be a pretty rough mistake. Kingpin is much faster and much much stronger than Spider-Man initially realizes, being actually composed of almost entirely muscle. He gets Peter with a good grab and slam, and then out of left field, he uses a gas to knock out the spider by the end of issue number 51. Now, issue number 52 sees Kingpin's goons putting Spider-Man and J. Jonah Jameson in an extremely supervillainy chamber, locking them up and slowly filling it with water. Sure, Spider-Man does escape, but even the final fight against Kingpin sees the villain get a bunch of good hits and even escape. Number eight, Mephisto. One More Day is infamous among Spider-Man fans, and understandably so. The story completely retconned Spider-Man's marriage to Mary Jane Watson out of continuity, and it was all thanks to Mephisto. And poor choices by Marvel, but whatever. This was a relationship that had been built up over literal decades, that had been carried over into the movies, the newspaper strip, every other version of Spider-Man. It was arguably Marvel's best romance, and Mephisto took it all away in exchange for saving Aunt May's life. The storyline takes place after Marvel's Civil War crossover, where Spider-Man revealed his secret identity to the world. In the fallout after Civil War, dozens of villains targeted Peter Parker and his loved ones, including Wilson Fisk, the Kingpin, and Peter's Aunt May was caught in the crossfire. Desperate to save May Parker's life, Spider-Man went to anyone and everyone to find some way to avert disaster. When no one else came through though, the devil himself, Mephisto, offered Peter a treacherous trade. May's life in exchange for Peter and MJ's marriage. Now, love it or hate it, it happened and it made Spider-Man give up his greatest love ever. Number seven, Black Tarantula. I'm not gonna lie, I didn't know much about Black Tarantula before this day, but now that I do, I actually really, really like him. He's super cool. So, showing up in The Amazing Spider-Man 432, Black Tarantula seemingly attacks our spider hero out of nowhere, chucking half a chimney at him as his first move. Now, while Spider-Man tries to figure out who the heck this guy is and why he is after Spider-Man in the first place, he is dodging out of the way of optic blasts, massive punches, and even his webs do nothing as Tarantula just rips through them like tissue paper. Spider-Man even has a whole flashback about how Mary Jane wanted him to quit being Spider-Man during this fight, which was interrupted as Black Tarantula smashes through the wall that Spider-Man was standing on. Spider-Man ends up floating down to an alleyway, and while he gets maybe two or three punches on Tarantula, when the villain gets his hand on Spider-Man's ankle, it's all over. He slams Peter between the alleyway walls and down onto the pavement. He then literally rips off Peter's mask, revealing his bruised face, before telling him that he is sparing him so he can find Norman Osborn's missing child, but when 
when he's done that, Spider-Man needs to leave New York. He then walks off, leaving Peter in the fetal position, counting his injuries and thanking his stars that he's still alive. Number six, Cadaverous. Ivan Renz was an employee of Stark Industries alongside his mentor and Peter Parker's parents. They developed the key, a tech that could potentially bring people back to life. But the experiments failed, sending his mentor to the afterlife. Now, Tony Stark dismantled the unit, and Ivan eventually became the supervillain known as Cadaverous, only ever appearing in the J.J. and Henry Abrams written Bloodline Spider-Man storyline from 2019. Mary Jane Watson loses her life to Cadaverous on the fifth page of the first issue after Spider-Man is swarmed and beaten pretty badly by him and his minions. Then Spider-Man just completely quits. Twelve years later, the story has a one-armed version of Peter Parker, who is now the honestly pretty horrible single father of Ben Parker, Peter and Mary Jane's son. After Cadaverous returns out of hiding and kidnaps Peter to use his blood for his evil plans, it's up to the new Spider-Man, Ben Parker, with the help of his friend Faye Ito and old Tony Stark and Riri Williams to fight Cadaverous and his minions, which includes a cyber-zombified team of Avengers. Number 5, Doc Ock. Okay, so being one of Spider-Man's major arch enemies, Doc Ock has had quite a few different instances of bringing Peter down a peg or two. Today, we're gonna talk about the curious case of Otto's adamantium tentacles. So, way back in the day, Dr. Octopus happened to get his hands on some adamantium octopus arms. They were put out of commission and weirdly forgot about for a very long time until they made a spectacular proper return in Spider-Man 1990 issue 18 and issue 19. This is the revenge of the Sinister Six arc, and not only does Otto manage to make quick work of the entire Sinister Six to take control, even turning the Sandman into glass, when Spider-Man crashes the party, Otto manages to get a hold of him and slam him all over the place, tearing massive holes in Spider-Man's costume and throwing him hundreds of meters away out of the building they were fighting in. He even manages to completely thrash Professor Hulk with these arms too. It's actually kinda nuts. Number four. Or the Sandman. Okay, now look, this does absolutely take place in an alternate Earth, but it takes place on Earth Z, with versions of Spider-Man and Sandman who are canonically exactly the same, with all the same abilities as their usual selves. And that makes it terrifying. Allow me to explain. In Marvel Zombies Returns, the zombie heroes Spider-Man and Luke Cage end up on Earth 91126. Zombie Spider-Man thinks he can cure their zombie virus by finding the Lifeline tablet, but just as he is getting underway with the plan, he he gets mistaken for this Earth's normal Spider-Man, who went to go change his costume. It's really weird. He's then forced into a fight with Dr. Octopus, Electro, Mysterio, Vulture, Kraven, and Sandman, aka the Sinister Six. Despite trying his best to hold back his hunger, zombie Spider-Man completely lets go and brutalizes the entire squad of villains, with Sandman literally being the only survivor fleeing for his life. So. When the actual normal Spider-Man shows back up and confronts Sandman, having no idea what just happened, the terrified Sandman does not even try to let this Spider-Man anywhere close to him. He slams him ruthlessly with these massive sand mallets before turning into sand and forcing himself into Peter's mouth, landing inside of his stomach, and then bursting Spider-Man from the inside out. Say what you will about the extreme nature of this comic, but this is entirely possible for the Sandman to do anytime he wants, and that is terrifying. Number three, Electro. The Marvel Knights Spider-Man comic series was written with a more mature slant than previous Spider-Man titles. After a brutal fight with the Green Goblin in which Peter came out on top, Peter gets home only to find his beloved Aunt May has been kidnapped. His ensuing hunt leads him to the Owl, who tells him that Electro and the Vulture were the culprits. In a rage, Spider-Man finds the two and a massive fight breaks out as they're attempting to steal a big old chunk of change. Once their briefcase of money gets launched open, sending the money flying all over the place, Old Max loses his patience and blasts Spider-Man with a massive Electro shock that also causes a huge explosion. Now, with Electro revealing his new costume, he manages to get on powerful blasts one after another on Spider-Man, controlling metal objects and firing them all at Spider-Man and innocent bystanders, blowing up cars full of civilians before revealing how his time in prison has allowed him to come up with new ways to use his powers, including ionizing metal, as he literally slams a semi-truck onto Spider-Man. 
At the end of the fight, Spider-Man learns that the owl tricked him and was only using him for his own needs. In that moment of realization, Electro is able to blast him off of a skyscraper, sending him straight to the emergency room. Number two, Paul. Paul is straight up just a dick. For those of you who do not know, Paul is a very recent addition to the Spider-Man comics, and he is none other than Mary Jane's new squeeze. He also really randomly happens to have kids with MJ? I don't know. But what I do know is that he is a menace. Paul is the son of Emissary, but from a different reality entirely. That doesn't really matter. He did totally take out the villain himself, so he's not really a villain, but he stole Peter Parker's girl and spent four years with her due to time dilation, even adopting two kids. He's punched out Peter Parker and was defended by MJ herself. He then had the audacity to pay off some of Peter's medical fees out of sympathy and then invited him to dinner sometime. Paul and MJ stayed together and Peter has wanted her back the whole time since and quite honestly, screw Paul. I hate him. Number one, Spike. Now, most of you may think you don't know who Spike is, but I promise you, everyone knows who Spike is. Spike just happened to be a low-level criminal burglar operating in New York around the same time that Peter Parker started his journey as Spider-Man. This burglar had been the cellmate of the infamous Depression-era gangster Dutch Malone. In the 1930s, Malone lived in New York City's Forest Hills neighborhood. It was long rumored that Malone had hidden millions of dollars away somewhere in that house, and the burglar heard Malone talking in his sleep about where he hid the money. Spike the burglar next showed up in the hallway of a Manhattan television studio just as the young, naive Spider-Man stepped out of his dressing room. Having robbed the studio's office and being chased by security guard Baxter Bigelow, Spider-Man refused to help, allowing the burglar to make it into the elevator and escape. Turns out this would cost him as this is the very same burglar who would break into that house in Forest Hills owned by the Parker family and accidentally take the life of Uncle Ben, teaching Peter an important lesson about power and responsibility. Coming in at number 10 today is took villains to their graves and even single-handedly defeated the Sinister Six, taking the living brain as a trophy. He completely dumps MJ, but starts a relationship with Anna Maria Marconi, who became a popular medium. The symbiote's unique ability to bypass Spider-Man's spider sense stripped the hero of his primary defense that has helped him on so many other other occasions. And on top of that, Venom was even stronger and more durable than Spider-Man with sharp pointy teeth and a hell of a lot of extra symbiote abilities that the webhead was just not prepared to deal with. Their initial encounters were intense, with Spider-Man often on the receiving end of brutal beatings. This forced Spider-Man to adapt his fighting style drastically, as the symbiote-covered villain was relentless in his pursuit of the hero's demise. Number two, Green Goblin. He threw Gwen Stacy off the George Washington Bridge, orchestrated the Clone Saga, and wiped out Ben Riley right in front of Peter Parker. Norman Osborn is absolutely Spider-Man's number one adversary, simply for the fact that he has caused Peter more emotional pain than any of his other villains, even Doc Ock. Now obviously, everything that I mentioned was Norman, but Harry Osborn was also the Green Goblin, adding physical and emotional turmoil to the whole thing. Now I don't think I need to pick one event in particular, but I would say that Gwen Stacy was the worst of the bunch. Green Goblin proved to Spider-Man that he is not able to save everyone. Even though Peter was so close, he still failed. And when you think about it, Green Goblin made it so that Peter was the one to shoot the web that broke Gwen's back. He may not have known that's how it would go down, but he lucked out with that move, not only terrorizing Peter, but completely psychologically tormenting the poor guy. And finally, Finally, in at number one today, it's The Spot. Jonathan Owen is a villain that only well-versed fans of Spider-Man would recognize, or it used to be that way before Across the Spider-Verse came out. Now as The Spot, Jonathan hasn't always been the most relevant villain of Peter Parker. He often ends up on lists of Spider-Man's worst and unknown villains. I mean, when he first confronted Spider-Man and announced his villain moniker in Peter Parker the Spectacular Spider-Man Volume 1, Issue 99 in 1985, the hero hit the ground laughing. Thing. Literally, he fell on the ground and was laughing. It was bad. But it made it all the more embarrassing for Spider-Man when the spot 
actually defeated him. Spot threw Peter in and out of his dimensions using his whole portals, and he landed more than a few good punches on the hero. The spot doesn't hit hard, but as he says, even the strongest of trees can be felled by sufficient strokes from even the smallest of hatchets. Yes, he said that, I know it's weird. Eventually, he left Peter discombobulated with Black Cat having to help him back to his feet. He got his own back eventually, but still, the spot took him down. <laughs> 